Good morning, everyone. My name is Deanna Allen, and I am the Climate Change Coordinator for the town of Pelham. Uh, a little bit about myself, I actually studied here at Brock University. I got my undergrad here, so great choice. And uh, I have a Master's of Arts in Environmental Management and Sustainability at Monash University, which is in Melbourne, Australia. So I also recommend going over there. It's um, not only beautiful, but I learned a lot. Um, so before I dive into the municipality itself, I just want to bring to light this tree. This is the uh, Canadian sugar maple. It's the oldest sugar maple in Canada, and it is in Pelham. And I highly recommend that you all go check it out because it is absolutely beautiful. And I'm sure all of you are environmentalists, so especially during the fall time, it's gorgeous. So this is the clicker? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so Pelham. For those of you who aren't from the Niagara region, Pelham is located in the center of the Niagara region. And like all of the other municipalities, we're sandwiched between Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. Um, our population is primarily 17,000 people, but that's from our 2016 consensus. So now I'm, it's much higher. Um, and we have five uh, historic communities, which is Fenwick, Font Hill, Ridgeville, um, North Pelham, and Effingham. Um, Pelham has two main creeks, Coyle Creek, which is in the south, uh, kind of by Welland, and then the 12 Mile Creek. I don't know if any of you have checked that out before, but uh, it is the creek that has uh, it's a very rare freshwater system that is native to the brook trout and uh, the numbers are declining due to climate change you know an increase in temperature changes in water variability and uh, development so it is a municipality that is mixed with urban and rural communities uh, it's rich in history productive agriculture and growing commercialism and if you are here in the summer during thursday nights we have our pelham supper markets Great food trucks, great food trucks, great events. Highly, highly recommend it, as well as other community events as well. So a little bit of the about the demographics. Uh, Pelham is amongst one of the fastest growing communities in the Niagara uh, Peninsula. Since the formation of 1970, our population has grown 74%. Uh, and again, that's according to the 2016 population consensus. So. You know, in, uh, in 1970, we were at approximately 10,000 and we jumped up to 17, and that's not just the true representation because we're now in 2020. Um, the majority of the population is made up of seniors, 65 years and older. Um, and that population has increased by 117% since 90, 1996. Uh, each resident, you know, there's an average income of 93,000 after taxes, 62 of the population have post-secondary degrees and there's a 94% employment rate. All right, so I'm not entirely sure as to what you've been brought up to speed with Niagara DAPS, but Pelham has found it remarkably helpful. Um, we, in our second workshop, we downscaled climate data and we brought forth that data and created an adaptation team, which consists of Dr. Jessica Blythe, Ryan Plummer, my supervisor and myself. And what we did is we created an internal adaptation steering committee, which consists of uh, municipal representatives from all of our departments. So we've got uh, recreation, culture and wellness, uh, community planning and development, public works and so forth. And so what we did is we took those climatic threats that we identified in Niagara DAPS and um, I sat with each committee member and went through all of the climatic threats and identified how climate change will impact their municipal department. And that was great because um, a lot of our municipal representatives found climate change or the topic of climate change very daunting. So Pelham took the one-on-one -on -one approach compared to other municipalities that actually got everyone together. We found it was easier to have one-on-one um, -on -one interviews. And so this is just a small synopsis of what we have discovered. Um, in summer, we had, I know it's a bit small, um, since 2018, in 2018 and 2019, we had 17 days of extreme heat temperatures, which is over 30 degrees Celsius, 10 extreme weather warnings, thunderstorms and heat warnings, which is the result of the cancellation of one of our supper markets, which generates a fair amount of money. Um, we had the closure of the John Nemi Trail due to a windstorm. Um, and in the winter we have, which is huge, that's one of our biggest threats is freezing rain. So we had 30 days of extreme cold temperatures, which is minus 15 degrees Celsius, 
15 days of town closure, uh, you know, buildings and facilities. Um, and we lost, I don't know have, if you have been to Pelham before February of 2019, we had the famous Pelham Arches. We lost that due to a terrible windstorm um, with gusts up to 110 kilometers an hour. And another huge issue that we're facing with the increase in average temperatures, we had the infestation of the gypsy moth, uh, which was a terrible, terrible infestation that we had last year. And it cost $89,000 to spray just areas that had high infestations. Um, and this year it's unfortunately, we, we, uh, we got a survey of the egg masses and it's going to be unfortunately even worse. So these are just some examples of some climate change impacts that we've identified. And so, like I said, with our internal committee, we looked at, this is a, the downscale da data that we have, uh, that an activity that we did with Niagara Adapts. And I thought it was really important to look at the um, increase in average temperatures, extreme um, cold and heat, uh, as well as precipitation, because we're notorious for having flooding in our, uh, in our municipality. One of our roads actually, we had to permanently close down due to erosion from uh, heavy rainfall events. And we're working on repairing that uh, right now. And these are just some examples of what our internal committee members have identified. So some of them had said summer droughts will lead to shortages on our water supply. More frequent episodes of rain will result with severe washouts and flooding to our roads, like I said, with our Sulphur Springs uh, road. Staff will have a higher likelihood in experiencing heat stress due to over 30 degrees Celsius days. We have a massive festival that we run in July. It's called Summerfest and staff are outside working constantly. We, and we found out that there's no cooling stations. So that's one of our climate action items that we're going to implement. And I'll talk to you about the scope in just a second. So if some of you are wondering. Uh, freezing rain will knock down hydro lines and other debris, which can lead to road closures and dangerous accidents. More demand for town services will add wear and tear on town equipment. That was a huge um, impact that coming from me. I had no idea it was identified by one of our representatives in our fire and bylaw services department. And he said, you know, imagine you, there's a lot of, uh, we're experiencing more precipitation during the winter season. They're constantly taking on their equipment and taking off and they can't have, you know, damp or worn equipment when they're dealing with emergency uh, scenarios. Um, we'll have an increase in tropical nights, which will alternate reproductive uh, patterns for all plant materials. So even with our parks guys that are out there planting, you know, different types of material at our, uh, like plants at our municipal buildings, like all of that is changing. And while I identified the negative impacts, I also think it's really important to take light of the opportunities that climate change is bringing forth as well. And we've identified um, some of those with our internal committee. Um, we've also created an external stakeholder advisory committee, which was identified by our members on our internal committee. Um, and we've, I've reached out to them and once we receive our vulnerability analysis assessment from Brock, we'll be getting in touch with them and basically get things on the road. All right, so the number one question, why is the town of Pelham creating a climate change adaptation plan? So. The reason why we're doing this is because Pelham wants to increase the adaptive capacity and resiliency to our town assets and services. And we want to implement climate change adaptation practices in our day-to-day -day operations. And once this plan is developed, um, climate change uh, staff will have a better understanding how they can um, prepare for climate change, how they can protect their property. And we have this upcoming asset management plan that we need to uh, implement. And this plan, the climate adaptation plan will provide further support to the uh, asset management plan. And this is the number one question is what is your scope? Because I've been, I've had uh, residents reach out to me being like, oh, well, what about the community? And due to time constraints, the, the scope of the plan is corporate. So it's only focusing on the town of Pelham. However, it does have some components of the community. But like I said, it's just particularly foc focusing on the town. Another reason why we're doing this uh, plan is because we have supporting documentation for it. So in 2019, the town released their strategic plan and amongst their six uh, strategic priorities, one specifically states that the town wishes to grow revenue by promoting our cultural assets while protecting our environmental assets. And by doing that, what, we're, what we are trying to do is introduce best practices related to climate change and for the protection and preservation of environmental assets 
as well as this is the number one thing is to educate and get the community involved because council will not listen to you unless you have the community to back you up. So that's what we're really focusing on is reaching out. Niagara DAPS really helped with our residential vulnerability uh, survey. Um, and yeah, those are the two object objectives to meet our uh, goal. So this is where we currently are um, with our timeline. Uh, like I said, we have established a team. We've identified prospect uh, external stakeholder advisory um, members. We gathered baseline data. Uh, we're, um, we've downscaled our climate impacts. Um, we had the vulnerability survey, and now that we have, we will get our results. What we're going to do is we will conduct a vulnerability and risk assessment. We'll prioritize our actions, and then we'll research best municipal practices and create an implementation schedule for the plan. And I believe that's it. Oh, sorry, one last one. Um, Pelham and Niagara DAPS. So a lot of municipalities have reached out to us and they're like, why are you participating with Niagara DAPS? Well, why wouldn't we? We're collaborating all of our ideas with other local municipalities. We all want to gain a stronger understanding of how can we adapt to climate change? What are the best municipal practices? And we're not reinventing the wheel here. We're, we're working together to build a stronger and more resilient region. And Another um, priority or objective that we have is we want to integrate or update our performance criteria for our engineering design guide, specifically with storm water management. So we're trying to find ways because Pelham has a lot of new development coming into play and we want to find ways for developers so they cannot opt out of climate change. And that's it. Um, hello, my name is Jesse. I'm a planner with the town of Niagara and the Lake. Uh, Rob and Andrea wasn't able to uh, attend today. So about the town of Niagara and the Lake. Uh, so it's a it's a smaller town. It's um, in uh, it's in the north uh, borders St. Catharines, Niagara Falls, uh, and it has uh, as of the uh, in the 2016 sentence, census. It had 17,000 people. Um, a large, a large portion of the residents within the town are seniors. Uh, it is expected to grow by 40 percent by the year 2031, um, and it has a rel fairly low density population. Part of the reason is a large portion of the lands are used for agriculture. It's within the green belt, and uh, it also has a large tourist component. So. Three, every annually, we receive 3.5 million tourists. So some of the features within Niagara and the Lake are to the south, we have the Niagara Escarpment. Um, below the Niagara Escarpment, we have a uh, very fertile soil. Uh, it's considered to be a unique agricultural area, tender of fruit and grape. One of the few areas that's able to grow these types of crops within the region. There's a lot of, uh, there's many greenhouses within uh, Niagara. Uh, we have 50 or so. And we have a unique municipal irrigation channel that services the farmlands. So uh, we, have a, we have a unique history. We're uh, uh, founded in the late 1700s, 1793. Um, we have a lot of uh, historic sites such as Fort George, Butler's Barracks, Brock Monuments, uh, Queenston Heights, and we also have uh, the Queen Picton Heritage Conservation District. Uh, these are, a lot of these are um, considered national as well as uh, municipal uh, heritage districts. Uh, there's a unique blend of uh, tourism and agricultural lands. And uh, the, we have a very active resident population and they are, um, in, and they have an understanding of uh, protecting uh, the wetlands and uh, retention of woodlands, uh, mitigating shoreland erosion, uh, decreasing damage caused by development, and uh, for the protection of areas of um, natural and scientific interest. So one of the reasons why we're interested in, or some of the reasons why we're interested in climate change adaptation is because we do have a higher frequency of intense storm. We have been experiencing higher frequency of intense storms 
uh, which has been causing flooding and damage to homes and infrastructure. Um, excess rainfall has the ability to impact soil, uh, washing away uh, some of the nutrients that are needed for higher yielding crops. Uh, rising lakes does have an impact on the dated infrastructure and homes along the shoreline. Uh, we, I mean, last year we had a one Lake Ontario arose. Um, we had a large, we had a lot of flooding within the on the roads near Lake Ontario. And uh, extreme droughts also have an impact on agriculture, uh, on agricultural lands. So some of the impacts we've identified through this process were the, the frequent freeze and thaw cycles are causing stress to the roads and infrastructure. Um, there's been a decrease in bee population, which plays an essential role on our ecosystem. And there's variations in winter uh, spring start times that can cause delay or emergence in spring uh, flowering and may disrupt nectar and pollen uh, available for fruits such as peaches, apples, and grapes. So what we hope to achieve in the process, uh, so we're still probably pretty early on in, in developing our plan. Uh, I think uh, from the previous presentation, I think Pelham has done a lot more to date, uh, but the town is hoping to become a leader in climate change adaptation. Um, hoping to we're also hoping to achieve a higher level of customer service and awareness with an additional hope to uh, initiate programs. Uh, we have done some work already. So recently we've adopted a tree bylaw. Um, this tree bylaw affects the urban areas. So you would need a tree per a permit to cut down uh, trees that are identified within the tree bylaw. It mostly protects Carolinian type of tree species, which uh, Niagara Lake is within the Carolinian zone. Um, and the town is also working towards a single-use plastics bylaw to prohibit the sale of single-use plastics. Thank you so much. Um, so um, my name is Shannon Fernandez and I'm the climate change um, coordinator at the town of Lincoln. In the spring of 2017, back-to-back -back spring storms caused extreme flooding from Lake Ontario. Residents who live along the Lincoln shoreline were awakened by volunteer firefighters informing them that the road leading to their home was washed out and that the town had declared a voluntary evacuation as emergency vehicles could not access these homes. This extreme weather event led to about $1 million in damages to the shoreline, parks and sewer systems across the town of Lincoln. Lincoln is made up of several smaller communities, including Beansville, Camden, Jordan, and Vineland, with a new development, Prudhomme's Landing, in the process, the planning process. Lincoln is home to over 24,000 uh, people, and the population is projected to grow by 50% by 2031. Lincoln has 16 kilometers of Lake Ontario shoreline, and 70% of the town's land is protected by the Greenbelt and the Niagara Escarpment Plan. Key employment sectors include manufacturing, healthcare, and agriculture with over 50 wineries and 6,500 acres of farmland. As both our community and agricultural sectors are growing, the need to adapt to climate change is becoming ever more urgent. In that spirit, the town of Lincoln has committed to being a place to grow, a place to prosper, and a place to belong. The mission is to take pride in delivering municipal services with an efficient, effective, and customer-centered approach that results in a livable and sustainable community. Sustainability is not just a concept at the town of Lincoln, it's a guiding principle, and the town understands the responsibility to invest in sustainability policy um, from the policy and decision-making level. Lincoln's climate is projected to change in many ways, mainly becoming warmer, wetter, and more extreme. For example, we can ex um, expect more extreme hot days, milder winter temperatures, more extreme precipitation events, and more freeze thaw cycles. One opportunity associated with climate change is an extended growing season, or a projected extending growing season, um, which based on our huge agricultural sector could provide um, a lot of opportunity for some of our community members. 
These climactic changes have and will, and will continue to have drastic impacts on the town of Lincoln and its businesses, residents, farmers, as well as its built and natural um, environments. We expect impacts to include increasing uh, frequency of damaging storms that can damage infrastructure and crops, increased emergency management costs, increased energy consumption, particularly for air conditioning in the summer, uh, more basement flooding events, um, a decrease in ice wine growing season, an increase in water demand, especially for irrigation, more freestyle cycles, which I mentioned earlier, which can then lead to more road damage and increased maintenance costs. And of course, with warmer temperatures, um, increased frequency in waterborne and respiratory disease. Recent events in Lincoln also point to the need to adapt and build resiliency. In 2016, the town experienced record-breaking droughts, and in 2017, the extreme flood event. In 2019, when restoration works from the 2017 flood were completed and residents had come to term with the disaster, um, significant rainfall and winds led to the town's second voluntary evacuation, as well as further shoreline damage, beach closures, and flooding again across Lincoln. Over the last few years, the community has also experienced multiple weather alerts, ranging from extreme freezing rain, excessive heat, and extreme cold temperatures. Given the local nature of many climate, um, climate impacts like these floods and extreme temperatures, municipalities are at the front line to manage risk, protect community safety, and invest in sustainable um, economic growth. And through its mission of living, um, of creating a livable and sustainable community, the town of Lincoln is doing just that. At a government and policy um, level, the town has recently adopted a transportation master plan, a new parks, recreation and culture master plan, and is developing an asset management plan that all prioritize accessibility, sustainability, and building complete and resilient communities. Um, the town is also initiating the development of low impact development design standards and a community improvement plan, um, which encompass stormwater management practices that mitigate the impacts of increased runoff and stormwater pollution, and emphasizes conservation and on-site natural features to address water quality. Lastly, the town is also working on two projects dedicated to shoreline protection, um, as well as road improvements and climate adaptation. Beyond the efforts at a policymaking level, the town also collaborates with our community partners on several projects. In partnership with Brock University, the development of the Brock Lincoln Living Lab aims to address Lincoln's needs around community sustainability and well-being and gives the town access to this groundbreaking research specific to Lincoln, which will help guide future policy development and decision making. In partnership with the Vineland Research and Innovation Center, we are also researching green infrastructure and urban tree establishment at the new Prudhomme's Landing Development Site. The town has also been working very closely with our community, um, specifically with, um, in regards to water conservation. Last year, the town piloted a downspout disconnection program and rain barrel um, program and we provided up to four free rain barrels to residents in the Camden and Jordan Station area. Um, the program had a really remarkable 48% uptake rate, um, and that resulted in 5,000 liters per household per summer of water being prevented from going into our stormwater systems. Um, the town has also recently launched a water meter replacement program, which takes a phased approach to replacing all of the water meters in town with new advanced metering infrastructure or AMI technology that allows for real-time usage readings. When implemented in other municipalities, AMI has been shown to not only successfully improve efficiency, detect backflow events, and have proactive leak detection alerts, but also improve water conservation as residents are able to see their usage in real time and then make smarter choices. And of course, when talking about livable and sustainable communities, climate action is a key component. Um, the town has identified adaptation as a priority and is developing a climate adaptation plan to increase the adaptive capacity and resiliency of the town's programs, infrastructure, and shoreline to future climactic and extreme weather um, impacts. The development of this adaptation plan is supported by Niagara Adapts, a novel partnership which, which provides us with the opportunity to collaboratively work with our academic and municipal partners, approach climate change in a unique and innovative way, establish a community dedicated to action and education, and engage with our citizens in a meaningful way. The purpose of our adaptation plan, similar to the town of Pelham, is corporate in scope. And so it aims to prepare Lincoln for anticipated 
um, clim climate change by increasing the adaptive capacity of town-owned infrastructure, town-run programs, and our shoreline. Um, it will have three main outcomes, so identification of those impacts and the risk that they pose to the town, prioritize adaptation actions to reduce the risk and vulnerability associated with these climate impacts, as well as a detailed implementation plan, which includes costs, responsibilities, timelines, and importantly, a framework to monitor and evaluate progress. The scope, again, is corporate um, and focuses specifically on the town's assets, operations, and services. However, by conducting the work, understanding the downscaled um, climate data, doing those baseline vulnerability and risk assessments, it really sets the town up to um, explore a greenhouse gas mitigation or a community plan in the future. In partnership with our community research institutions and neighboring municipalities, we hope at the Town of Lincoln to continue to create a future um, that is sustainable, resilient, and allows its residents um, and its larger community to continue to be a place to grow, prosper, and belong to. Thank you. Well, um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Olivia Groff, and I am the Climate Change Coordinator with the City of St. Catharines. Um, so just an overview of what I will be talking about. I'm um, just going over corporate initiatives that have taken place to date um, and some examples that we felt in St. Catharines for climate change. And then talk about the development of the adaptation plan itself for the city of St. Catharines. Um, so just a quick overview of St. Catharines. Um, we're located on the north um, region of the Niagara region um, and Lake Ontario is closest to us. Um, we are a population of approximately 130,000. Um, an area of just under 100,000 kilometers, and we're predominantly urban. Um, we are the largest municipality in Niagara as well. Um, we have 11 kilometers of lakefront and about 30 creeks within uh, our area as well. So just an update on kind of what has taken place corporately with St. Catharines. Um, just last year in 2019, there was an updated strategic plan that took place. Um, there are four pillars to the corporate strategic plan um, and they all got updated and, and tweaks made. Um, the new kind of important part of the environmental pillar is that it now specifically states um, to minimize the environmental impacts of climate change, which is very important. Um, and then in April of 2019, council themselves decided to declare a climate emergency. Um, and St. Catharines was 29th in declaring a climate emergency in, um, across Canada. Um, and the greenhouse gas reduction targets are something that are a little bit newer as well. So there is both a community target and a corporate target that is in place. Um, the community target was endorsed in 2017 and they kind of follow similar along to uh, the corporate target. So the community target being households, residents, communities, um, businesses as well. Corporate target being um, the City of St. Catharines facilities, buildings, um, so that corporate City of St. Catharines um, focus. Um, and this target was just put in place in October of 2019. And it was included in what's called our Energy Conservation and Demand Management Plan. Um, this was a mandated plan by the um, province of Ontario but City of St. Catharines took a little bit step further and decided to incorporate greenhouse gas emission reduction targets within the plan. So as we can see the base year being 2011, um, the target was for a 2030 target with a reduction of 40% reduction. Um, as of 2019, we've already accomplished a 25% reduction in greenhouse gas intensity. Um, the new, um, so it, it did stop at 2030, a uh, couple weeks ago, there was community members that came to council and they wanted to push that further. Um, so in 2050, uh, the, the three community members had asked to see a net zero emission target. Um, council had actually approved that. Um, so that is now um, approved by council and will be incorporated into the next energy conservation demand management plan. And they also asked the 2030 target to be increased by 5%. So it's now uh, based off of a 45% percent um, reduction in greenhouse gas intensity for 2030. Um, so we're, we're well on our way to, um, to achieving that. And then another program that the City of St. Catharines is involved in, um, which kind of ties in both the mitigation and adaptation um, components, is what's called the Global Covenant of Mayors. So this is where the City of St. Catharines Mayor signed on. It's a voluntary program. 
Um, so there is both the mitigation stream, um, which you have seen we've committed to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. We've done an inventory, the reporting's been required um, for that. But then the next part is the adaptation uh, portion, which is really where this adaptation plan is falling in lines with achieving that program as well. And the City of St. Catharines signed on to that in 2015, so that's been kind of a ongoing program. Um, so the next is the, there was a risk assessment conducted in 2017. Um, so it's well known that climate change is going to intensify existing risks posed to municipalities. Um, so the ones that were top received risks in 2017 were heat waves, flooding, stormwater, extreme winter condi conditions, and uh, severe wind events as well. Um, so the, uh, oh, I was skipping. clicking through like it should. Um, we had, we might have a timer on it. Okay. Um, so, okay. Um, so <laughs> for St. Catharines and the Niagara region as a whole, we've experienced um, 56 extreme weather um, events in the past two years. So some of these th things can be seen as freezing rain, heat warnings, um, which are on the rise, um, swamp with basement flooding. So that was a big um, kind of event that happened just last year was uh, a lot of residential homeowners were experiencing basement flooding. Um, along with the high lake levels and then windstorm events as well. So some climate change concerns being that um, this is quite new um, to the Niagara region as a whole to dealing with climate change. Um, so really understanding that we're not reinventing the, reinventing the wheel, we're not starting from scratch. There's other municipalities who have worked on this. Um, so working together, working with others uh, will really enable us to kind of almost have a, a head start in this. Um, making sure that we're having sound science and evidence to make decisions is obviously very important. We're wanting to make sure that we have the best information possible to move forward with our adaptation plans. Um, and integrate climate change considerations into municipal decision making. So understanding that um, it's not just this plan that's going to sit on a shelf, it's really incorporating it to other aspects that the City of St. Catharines is already working towards. Um, effective communication and corporate and community actions are tying very closely together. Um, we've had um, bunch of uh, community groups being approaching our municipality and saying what are you doing what are you hoping to do what's the next phase um, of your actions and the urgency for action is definitely very apparent um, we've had two climate strikes um, take place in St. Catharines from community members across all of Niagara region um, so it's not just for St. Catharines residents that are attending these it's definitely felt um, as a Niagara region um, urgency um, action statement uh, which brings us to the importance of Niagara adapts um, so all municipalities that are a part of this definitely see this as a way that we can collaborate together. Um, we're sharing those best practices. We're obviously getting the best research from Niagara DATS um, to kind of put our be best foot forward um, and have that similar approach across all of Niagara too is really going to help us um, making sure that we're all kind of dotting our I's and crossing our T's at the same time. Um, so it's been so far very, very well received um, from our standpoint with the municipality. So in terms of where we're headed with the adaptation plan and what we've done to date, um, we've created um, an interdepartmental climate change adaptation team um, and that was just formed in November and the role will be to assess the impacts, refine and adopt a corporate adaptation plan initiated from the various departments of the city and together we've had about um, six meetings to date where we've been working collectively as a whole team. Um, and we've gathered climate data so far, we've looked at the impacts associated with the climate data as well, and that will really gear us towards where we're headed and what we're, what we're moving towards. And then um, a large part also is the internal and external communications um, for the adaptation plan. Yep. I brought it back. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> um, so this brings to the communication side of things. Um, there's definitely a, a need to increase climate literacy um, internally um, for all the, all the departments and staff as well as externally to the communication of the community. So um, there's been communications going both ways um, and this is an example of us set up at the um, farmers market in St. Catharines and we had a booth kind of promoting the Niagara DAPS um, survey that was taking place um, and we had 348 surveys completed 
altogether, which is great. So we can definitely see that there's an appetite for this in St. Catharines, um, which is very well uh, happy and received. So these are some kind of summaries of just some general trends of what um, St. Catharines is to uh, experience. So if no emissions were reduced, and this is the way that we were to continue on, by 2050 we'd experience things like um, warmer and wetter winters, which we've obviously seen even this winter, so an overall um, need to, to uh, heat our houses in spring and um, summer as well. We're going to see a little bit more, more rain. Um, and then we're going to have definitely an increase in the uh, heat days as well. And then altogether, because spring is getting longer, um, the fall will actually end up getting a little bit shorter. Um, and we'll also see general trend of, of more rain. So next steps for the adaptation plan, um, dying to get the answers from this vulnerability survey to lead us into our next phase of the risk and uh, vulnerability assessment to our plans. Um, we're already working on a climate change policy, which we're hoping to take to council. Um, that way the community gets updated as well as council to understand where, where we're headed um, and what we're working towards um, and have public and stakeholder feedback as well, um, which will be an ongoing part of the adaptation plan and then have a draft and final ad adaptation plan for council approval as well. So in conclusion, um, St. Catharines has targets in place that were reaffirmed in October as well as again just a couple weeks ago. Um, so making really sure that community is on, on support of our, of our goals as well. And we have a climate change adaptation plan in motion. We've definitely felt community support um, and we're entering 2020 with some great momentum um, in terms of climate action. So thank you. Thank you guys. So I'll be talking a bit about uh, some of the climate change impacts in Welland and uh, initial climate change work done as well. But before we do that, a bit about myself. Um, I did four years of university up at in Nipissing in North Bay, very snowy up there. That was in environmental sciences and physical geography. And just last year I completed my, my master's in climate change at Waterloo. So now we're here. Is it click? Uh, so a bit of background about the city of Welland. It's got a population of 53,000 and growing. 2019 was a record year for Welland in a sense that there were uh, record numbers of permits and issue, issues being built, uh, meaning that the population is only going to increase. Uh, it's also got a flat topography, mostly consisting of heavy clay. Therefore, it's got a uh, very poor drainage. And we have a very, very old wastewater and stormwater uh, infrastructure. We are still on the, the current design from 1967, just kind of going to show you how out of date and how vulnerable our waste, uh, our, our storm system infrastructure is. So this is uh, some initial climate change work. This started in, in 2012 when we did a vulnerability assessment on that wastewater and stormwater infrastructure. We partnered with Engineers Canada and at the end of that assessment, 44 recommendations were made, 11 of which would cost between $100,000 and $500,000 to repair, and 14 of which deemed uh, ASAP required attention right away. So it's been about eight years now that we've known the city's infrastructure for wastewater and stormwater is extremely vulnerable, and it's only more susceptible uh, to climate change in the future as well. So this continued in 2014 when we did a cost-benefit analysis on some of the stormwater ponds for uh, recent subdivisions. Now these are subdivisions that were built to that 1967 standard. Um, and basically this, the, the purpose of this benefit assessment was to look at if we incorporated climate change into these, into these subdivisions, how much more would it cost? So the result was by 2020 and 2050, our stormwater management ponds weren't going to be able to um, we're, we're going to be able to maintain the amount of water that was coming from the early spring melts as well as the increased precipitation uh, that we're expected to see in the future. Uh, so before I get into the impacts, I kind of wanted to just address the difference between climate change and extreme weather. So the Earth's warming. The, it's, it's seen through ocean temperatures, seen through surface temperature, as well as uh, air temperature as well. So this, this warming is causing changes in our average conditions, which is shifting to a more frequent and more extreme weather 
uh, climate in the future. So the weather's or the climate's getting a lot more dynamic, and a sense is that we don't know what to expect. And that's a good ex a good example would be what's going on this winter. When in 2019, Environment Canada predicted the snowiest winter on record, and we've had quite the opposite. So that just kind of goes to show you a sense is that we're in this era of dynamic weather, essentially the tip of the iceberg, and that we don't really know what to expect um, in the years down the line. So these are some of the conditions uh, being experienced in Niagara right now. So currently we're getting more rain in the winter, we're getting hotter summer with more droughts as well as stronger storms that are more dynamic, harder to predict, more in, uh, increased rainfall, and uh, an increase of 1.3 degrees Celsius um, annually. So that's from the 19, 1960s we've had that increase in temperature. Um, and for the future, by the 2050s, we're ex uh, expected to to see a three to four degree increase in temperature, as well as a lot stronger storms and more dynamic winters, increased freeze thaw cycles. So that four, three to four degrees increase doesn't seem like a lot, but putting it into perspective, the human body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. A one degree increase is considered a fever. A two degree increase will have you uh, in the hospital. So three to four degrees is quite a substantial amount to be increasing in such a short period of time. Uh, so a bit more local into a well in context, these are some of the impacts that have already been experienced and we are anticipating for. So in businesses, increased infrastructure repair, uh, increased downtime from power outages, as well as um, increased insurance rates from severe weather. Uh, for residents, we have increased flooding basements, uh, increased heat related illnesses from the much warmer temperatures as well as consistent droughts that are going on in the summer as well. Um, for infrastructure, they're heavily impacted by freeze-thaw cycles, damages to roads. Um, water gets into the roads and when it freezes, it expands, therefore causing tons of damages to roadways, um, as well as pavement, pavement softening from increased hot weather as well. Um, and the environment, the warmer climate will allow the population of ticks to increase and the decrease in colder temperatures will allow them to thrive in the winter time as opposed to dying off like they usually do. So this is a, a recent event of flooding that happened in Welland. This is in the Dane City suburb. This was a rain on snow event. So the ground was frozen and this rainfall happened I believe early February in 2018 and the result was the stormwater system couldn't handle the capacity of rainfall and what it caused flooding to 25 plus homes in the uh, Dane City area. So this kind of just goes to show that we need to address the vulnerable state of our stormwater system as you know these these kind of systems and storms are only going to increase in the future so why wait until these damages get worse why wouldn't we do something about it right now. So where do we go from here? Uh, the city plans to update its municipal standards as well as its, uh, as well as its engineering standards, um, replacing the old 1967 IDF curve with um, 2020 or a 2050 IDF curve, just to kind of show that these are the impacts that we expect to see in the future. How can the residents and how can the community uh, adapt to these and be ready? Uh, this is the responsibility of us as we are the front line to kind of prepare the community for these impacts. And we also plan to assess our stormwater management facilities. This could include increased uh, floodplain mapping and flood risk mapping as well, and kind of sh uh, educating and showing residents, you know what, these are the areas that are susceptible to flooding. This is what you can do um, in the event that these, these flooding events do occur. And lastly, of course, the development of the climate adaptation plan with this partnership. Um, this just goes to prepare well and make them more resilient and increase their adaptive capacity. Uh, we got we to gotta see this as an opportunity to take advantage and, and build a sustainable community, not as, a, not as an opportunity um, to be more aware. Questions? Good morning, everyone. Sorry for being a little bit late. It was a busy morning this morning. So my... Oh, I was... Let me just be able to click. Okay. 
So my department's environmental services. So what we do, and I'm, it might be a little bit different than the other presentations, is we do the water wastewater operations in the city. So, you know, something breaks, we fix it. Uh, if there's flooding, we address it. Basement flooding, groundwater flooding, things like that. So it might be a bit of a different purview than the other speakers. Um, I've been with the city for 12 years now, manager in the department for about four or three now. I am fighting a bit of a cold, so bear with me. Um, so here's some stats about Niagara Falls specifically. Our population, as you can see, can increase pretty significantly over a weekend. So our infrastructure is built to handle that. We go from just kind of 88,000 normal residents up to, you know, uh, long weekend, New Year's Eve, things like that, almost a million people. So we have to kind of build infrastructure to be able to handle all of that. Um, we're seeing significant growth still in our city. Uh, I think they've built probably 1,400 new homes in the last three months or so in the south end. Um, we touch a lot of municipalities. The way our infrastructure is set up actually is water flows through Niagara Falls, supplies Niagara on the Lake, Thorold, um, and ultimately, uh, yeah, two parts of Thorold. Um, we do have a very, very large area we actually cover. So 40 years to the south here, but our actual infrastructure kind of ends along these dotted lines here. So that's our urban service boundary. Um, to the north is Niagara on the Lake, obviously. Uh, to the east is our friends in the United States. And then to the west is Thorold, technically. Um, so within this boundary here, we probably have the better part of 78,000 residents that receive municipal servicing with about 10 that have no municipal servicing. So that means um, they're on cisterns or wells, septic tanks, things like that. Um, so to tie it back to climate change and kind of the reason why we're here is we had two pretty significant events uh, a few years back. These are kind of the ones that stick out when we talk about them internally still. Hey, do you remember this? Do you remember this? And everybody's got some war stories from these two events. So the July uh, 2013 flooding in July was a significant rain event, hit the whole region. And then we had a different rain event that was kind of an ice event as well in December the same year. And then 2015 with the polar vortex. So I'll go into some more detail as to, to what we experienced. So um, or the July 19th event, I remember I was eating dinner somewhere down in the tourist area. Skies go you know, pitch black, probably within an hour the phone starts buzzing. This street's flooded, this street's flooded, this street's flooded. We had manholes levitating the whole nine yards. It was a pretty crazy event. We actually had sewer. I don't know if anybody's familiar with manhole structures. So, I mean, it's a massive piece of concrete and the thing was actually floating up, breaking through the ground. We, tons of infrastructure damage and more importantly, tons of actually damage to private property. So, sustained wind speeds of 100 kilometers an hour. Unfortunately, we see that more and more these days. Um, the 24 hour rain event was pretty significant. So we're talking, you know, the better part of four inches of rain. So if you imagine this much rain falling within a 24 hour period, and the majority of that fell between like a five hour time window, that's a lot of rain for any system to handle, um, especially uh, an aging infrastructure like Niagara Falls. And you'll see through this next slide that different areas of the city were hit differently. This is just kind of the, the timeline, and I'm sorry, the bottom gets cut off there, but. The, the peak event, and it always happens, um, always happens at night when things are black, people are tired. <laughs> it, it's just the way emergencies go. It's you kind of expect it, I guess, now. But we had quite a bit of rain fall within you know, a half hour period, so almost a better part of an inch of rain. So the interesting part is we're in Niagara Falls used to kind of experiencing some flooding in this area. So we didn't actually get that much rain in that area. As it, so essentially what happened is the storm moved from west to east as it usually does but it also kind of carried north a little bit so that little bullet up top there where you'll see the the peak rainfall of you know 50 mils so that's two inches of rain within an hour that area of the city doesn't get hit as often but the infrastructure is actually the oldest in the city so that's the area we were seeing manholes levitate people were doing all sorts of crazy things to get the water off of the road because they thought water on the road is a bad thing so we actually had a resident take a pick and you know, if you get a manhole they have little holes in them that we used to, to access with the resident thought, hey, I'm gonna get the water off the road by lifting this manhole lid up. So everybody's drained a bathtub before. You've seen that kind of vortex, that swirl. This person added the better part of, I don't know, a foot of water for the length of a road to the sewer system. Magically, the water disappeared off the road. However, it showed up in everybody's basements. So there's little things like that, that as you see flooding and things like that, that people kind of don't consider as, as being impactful. Someone was trying to be helpful, quite the opposite. 
so six months later, we went through all the claims process. So uh, in the municipal world, if damage happens, we receive claims from residents. Um, we, I think we had the better part of 300 claims during that July event, just due to flooding and basement flooding, over land flooding, you name it. So six months later, everybody's basements are cleaned up. Everybody's good now. We're not worried about it. It's winter time. We don't really get too much flooding in the winter. And we got this weird mix of rain, snow, ice man, event where, again, almost a four inches of rain in the better part of a 24 hour period. But this time with it being cold, plus the rain, plus the snow melt, catch basins are designed, those square things on the side of the curb are designed to take that rain or eventually melt. Those were covered in ice, snow, whatever else. So we were experiencing some pretty significant road flooding, more basement flooding. All part of these kind of weird events that we're not really used to experiencing. You know, generally, not this winter obviously, but there's always that kind of January thaw we experience and those are fairly standard things. But what we're seeing now more and more are these odd events and you can't predict them. You don't know when they're going to show up, but you got to be able to react to them. Another fun event. So 2015 polar vortex. Um, so again, my department were responsible for the operation and maintenance of the water wastewater system. Specifically in this case, when we're digging in January, February, March, we experience about four feet of frost in the ground. That's fairly standard. All of our designs were municipal designs were based on four feet of frost. So someone's water service, is buried you know, the better part of four or five feet. We don't really typically experience freezing. That particular winter, we experienced frost up to six feet in the road. That means the 254 people had their water service frozen at one point in time or another. In order to fix that, we've actually got to dig at the property line or dig in the road, thaw it out with a torch or another method that we have, insulate it and hope it doesn't freeze again. We spent the better part of $800,000 in that time frame from January 1st to March 20th just supplying people with water, something that we all take for granted every morning. A terribly unexpected cost, but it's something we had to do. We also had to supply bottled water for people, uh, constant customer service updates. You can imagine if someone was pretty upset that their water service froze and they hear that there's 200 people ahead of them in line. That, that's a tough thing to sell. So kind of uh, some outcomes of, of that particular, we'll roll back. So some outcomes of this, we, we've had to change our design standards for water main installation. What we used to bury 1.5 meters, we now bury 1.8 meters. We found that that's a pretty safe elevation to, to install water services at. Um, from the flooding, we've also put more money into monitoring how much inflow and infiltration get into the system. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but as you experience these events, you kind of have to adjust your, your operation and, and kind of figure out, okay, I can't control the event, but what can I do to mitigate it? And how can I help the residents in the future from experiencing this type of personal issue again? So we've taken some small steps. I mean, being here is a, probably the, one of the biggest steps that we've taken, um, but we're replacing ash trees lost through the, the ash borer. Um, part of that, what we're doing now is more diverse planting through subdivisions. So as we're planting things, we're not just picking one particular species of tree to go down the street, because if you go down some streets now, you will see there are no trees because that's one species was picked for a subdivision. It looked nice, everybody liked it, but that doesn't help be, us being uh, resilient. We do spring tree planting sales. We still do uh, rain barrel sales, low flow toilet rebates, where if you've got a toilet that uses 20 liters of water, for example, you bring in your receipt, say you've purchased a new toilet and it's a low flow toilet, we'll actually reimburse you for the cost of the toilet. Um, the Alert Labs Flowey is a bit of an interesting device. Essentially, it's like a Fitbit for your water meter. So what it does is we, it hooks up to your water meter and what it's able to do is tell you consumption. If you've got a leak in your house, you can hook it up with other devices that Alert Labs um, produces, um, flood devices, all sorts of interesting things. And then you get a text on your phone saying that there's abnormal usage at your house. Maybe you have a flood, maybe you have a leak. Uh, it actually tells you if the temperature in your water area is cold. Uh, we had one city facility where the furnace kicked out, so it went to one degree Celsius, so pretty close to freezing. I get an alert on my phone. We went over there right away and addressed it. Probably saved the better part of $100,000 worth of plumbing work in one of our city facilities. Um, more recently, we've been, we des uh, city council endorsed being a bee city, so that's, we're doing pollinator gardens, uh, wildflower sales, things like that. Uh, we've also banned the use of Plastic bottles, plastic straws, plastic stir sticks, single-use things inside city facilities. 
So if you go into our arenas or things like that, we've got bottle filling stations. Just little steps we can take to kind of help mitigate extra waste. And then some things that we've learned thus far, and a lot of this came out of reviewing the climate data and, and where we're moving on things in terms of temperature and things like that. So I'm responsible for 40 individuals to go outside every day and work. With the, the temperature exceeding 30 degrees Celsius over 30 times during the year, it, it, there will be times where it's not safe for them to work. So we've actually talked about, you know, it's, it's 20 years away, mind you, but it's very likely I'll still be working in that time frame. So it's possible that our 8 to 4 shift might have to move to like a 5 to midnight shift or something like that, where you're not working in the heat of the day or kind of alternatives to things like that. Um, there's also going to be the strain on our volume, vulnerable population whether it's people with housing issues, elderly, things like that. Things that we're going to have to address as a municipality because they, they are our residents, we do need to help them. And the last bullet, the rain intensity. So our system's designed to handle a certain amount of rain over a certain period of time. And in theory, if everything was installed perfectly, there's no infiltration, nothing extra is getting into the sewer system. Nothing's perfect and things get old. Uh, what we're seeing more and when we're monitoring these things more is that our system's old, we're getting extra leakage in the system. Extra leakage, leakage actually costs extra money for treating rainwater at the wastewater treatment plant. That's more energy being used, increased rate costs for residents. All things that could be addressed slowly over time. It's not something we can fix tomorrow, but it's something we kind of have to pay attention to today in order to address it for tomorrow. Our council's been fairly forward in terms of funding our capital replacement programs. Oops. And, sorry. So they've been fairly forward in funding our capital replacement programs, um, doing studies, flow monitoring studies, seeing how much water actually is getting to our system that doesn't belong. Um, so we're doing all these steps, but they take time. And, and part of these steps is this climate adaptation plan that we'll be producing you know, in the next year or so where we're able to kind of do some infrastructure things, do some more customer service related things, maybe look at our, our carbon footprint and things like that, like other municipalities are doing, and essentially kind of figure out how we can kind of adjust our municipality with the ever-changing world that's out there. I can't stop it, but we can certainly look to mitigate it and address those issues as they come up and be prepared for them. One of the big things in our department is emergency preparedness, and I don't see this any different than that. I can't stop an emergency from happening, but I can make sure that we're ready for it. Um, so like I said, my purview is a little bit different maybe, but from a um, utility perspective, these are the kind of things we experience and the things that we try to do to, in order to help residents, help try to mitigate disaster and address it as we see them. So if anybody has questions, I'd be happy to answer. And Thank you so much, Baharak, and thank you to all our climate coordinators and the partners um, in this, in this uh, to your partnership for sharing your experiences with us this morning. Um, it, it's so easy for us in Canada and particularly in Ontario to think that climate change is very far away, but climate change is here and we've seen that this morning um, through all the presentations that we've had. Um, and what it really emphasizes for us is that there is an urgent need to adapt to climate change right here, right now and in Niagara. Uh, so that's what fuels uh, the interest and um, the, the motivation for the Niagara ADAPTS partnership. Um, so as you have been introduced to, Niagara ADAPTS is a two-year partnership. We are working with seven municipalities across the region uh, and our team here at Brock University to plan for adaptation um, together. One of the really exciting things from our perspective is that municipalities are really the right player to be leading this charge. Um, municipalities are such an important player for a number of reasons. Um, firstly, they're really on the front lines of climate change. You know, when your water pipes freeze, you call James. Um, they are really responding. Um, so they're on the front lines. They're interacting every day with the public who are experiencing these things. But also municipalities have a lot of really powerful levers and mechanisms that they can employ um, to affect climate adaptation um, planning. They provide services, they have, um, they do all the land use planning and so we're thrilled to be working with these municipalities because they are such an important player. Um, 
So this word cloud comes from a survey we sent out before the first workshop, which was back in June, I think, if I'm mixing up my times. Anyway, the reason that I love it is it's so proactive and optimistic, and it's easy to think of climate change as this massive challenge that we are struggling to deal with. There are certainly challenges associated, but there is a lot of optimism and a lot of action um, that is easy to overlook that I think is highlighted here in this word cloud. So um, through this two-year partnership, we are engaging in a climate change adaptation planning process. Uh, roughly, this is sort of what a planning process looks like. There are many flavors of this, um, but they all touch on the same uh, major phases. So to begin with, um, you need to initiate this thing, and that involves many steps, um, raising awareness, building support. As many of our coordinators um, shared with you, that involves a lot of people setting up steering committees, finding resources. So that's sort of the first phase um, of, the, of the planning process. Uh, next comes the research phase, and this is where we're really developing an evidence base, and it's one of the reasons why I think this is such a novel partnership is Climate change is new and very dynamic. So what's the best available information? How do we make sure that decisions made are being informed by evidence and not just um, sort of uh, on the fly? So the second phase is the research phase. Um, then generally you move into a, a development of your plan, prioritizing your adaptation actions. Implementation, I'm thrilled that we touched on it many times already today, but implementation is huge. Often these plans get developed and if they don't have teeth to actually take uh, traction or get traction, um, they're, they're not going to affect the kind of outcomes that we're hoping for. And then finally, um, monitoring progress. Are these things working? What kind of baseline information do we have to compare it to? Um, and and uh, then back around um, all over again. Critically, um, community engagement is at the center of this, and it happens throughout all the phases, and many of the presentations already touched on this this morning, but it's critical for many reasons. Um, one of them, which I think Olivia articulated, is climate literacy is required. Um, this is new, and it is emotive, and people are often upset for many reasons about climate change, so making sure that we're providing the best available information, that we're communicating clearly about what's happening, what's possible. Um, another key part of this is managing expectations. So we've been thrilled with the amount of interest and support um, in climate change adaptation planning, but it's also uh, this urgency um, sort of balanced with what we can do and how we're getting there is a really important part of engaging with the community as well to say here's what we're doing here's why we're doing these things um, so that's key so um, just to let you know where we are we've sort of moved through the first two phases of uh, the planning cycle we have just finished um, the uh, research phase and developing the evidence base. And just for context, um, this research phase involves many processes, uh, many steps. We've been engaging with this over the last six months or so. Um, and generally, these are the four sort of pieces of the evidence puzzle that we have been putting together. So uh, developing climate projections, which you saw this morning, some of those uh, uh, projections, looking at impact statements, and um, some of the coordinators talked through how they are doing that in partnership with various departments in their municipality, uh, risk assessments, and then finally, vulnerability assessments. So. I just want to put this out there for context that what I will talk about today is the vulnerability assessment, but that's just one of the pieces of ev evidence um, that are going into these plans. So uh, what is climate vulnerability? Um, it's intuitive and it is what it sounds like. Um, vulnerability to climate change is the degree to which a system where a municipality is susceptible to harm from climate change. Um, so generally, um, it's defined as a, f a function of the exposure to climate change. What are people actually experiencing? The sensitivity, so whether that be aging infrastructure um, or whether that be vulnerable populations, how sensitive is your uh, various components of your municipality? And then adaptive capacity, so what kind of um, resources and connections and uh, um, things can you leverage to actually respond to climate change. The reason understanding this is so important is that when you understand where municipalities are vulnerable, you're better able to proactively plan. Um, and it allows communities to address questions such as how are infrastructure, parts of the economy and part, um, various residents and subpopulations vulnerable to these impacts. 
So to understand climate vulnerability across these seven municipalities, we developed a survey, which we've um, heard reference to. We came up with 50 indicators, which are tailored specifically to the Niagara region that cut across these three dimensions of exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. And then with massive support from our partners, we rolled this out across um, the seven municipalities in the fall of 2019. Uh, many surveys were conducted face to face. You saw Olivia's booth set up there. Uh, people were out with tablets, canvassing people at various festivals and events. We also had the surveys available online. Some of you might have completed them. Um, and through that process, we were thrilled to have over a thousand people across these seven municipalities um, respond to our survey. And so it gives us a really rich picture of where we're sensitive, where we can invest, where are the opportunities to leverage um, adaptive capacity. So um, this is the world premiere of that data. I know these guys are excited to see it. Um, we, what I'm going to show here is a summary for all seven of the municipalities. We do have um, specific uh, outcomes for each of the seven partners, and those data will go up on our website live tomorrow, but we'll share it with you guys in the afternoon. Um, but for now, I would just like to look at, and again, this is just a sampling of some of the data that came out of this process. The reports themselves are between 50 and 100 pages. They're a massive piece of work that we engaged with, so this is just a sampling of what some of that looks like. So the first thing we wanted to look at was exposure to climate change and understanding how um, municipalities are exposed is critical for us to design meaningful actions to address this. So the first thing to look at uh, is that 74% of the people we talked to believe that climate change is impacting their community and that to me is encouraging because people are feeling the effects. Um, but if we look over here, uh, this is where it starts to get really important for us. So half of the people we talked to, over 500 people, experienced flooding in their community over the last two years. And a quarter of them have experienced these extreme cold events. We know that that's critical because changing precipitation patterns and these changing freeze-thaw cycles that um, our coordinators referred to, um, they can accelerate damage to municipal infrastructure, they can disrupt the provision of services, and so this is really important. Um, if we look over here, 56% of people we talked to had experienced extreme heat. And again, understanding how vast that or how frequently um, people are experiencing heat extremes is really critical for our planning processes. We know that hotter temperatures can magnify um, health problems across the region, and so digging into these is, is, is really useful for us. Um, importantly, only 21% of the people that we talked to felt that their municipalities are adequately uh, prepared to adapt to climate change. So what that says to me is what we are doing is urgently needed. People do not feel adequately prepared and what they need is a formal adaptation plans, implementation of these plans and what we're trying to address through this partnership I think speaks to this trend. Um, just so we don't feel bad here in Niagara, that is a similar trend that um, researchers have found across Canada. Um, in a paper that came out last year evaluating the quality of climate change plans across Canada, um, they found that most municipalities are just not prepared for the magnitude and the frequency of um, what we are experiencing. So we're not alone in that. Um, so the quantitative data allows us to answer questions that are quantitative, such as how many people are experiencing these things. But there's also um, a lot of uh, importance in qualitative data, and we collected that too. So we know that climate change is really a lived experience, and it's different from person to person. And we know that it's mediated by social factors such as uh, income level, age, pre-existing health conditions, etc. So I wanted to just look at a few of um, uh, examples of what some of this qualitative data looks like um, and how we tried to account for this really differentiated um, uh, aspect of climate change. So first thing is that we collected socially differentiated data, which means every person we talk to, we know what their income level is, we know what their age is, we know if they are a recent Canadian, um, the hypothesis being you might have fewer connections and they might not be as aware of things that are coming. So we have data um, in order to look through those vulnerable populations. Um, one of the ways we're doing that is through uh, Abby Ferris, who's one of my master's students. She's digging into some of the public health related um, components of that. 
The other thing we did was collected qualitative data. And it really gives us um, a richer picture of what is going on. So just to highlight a few of these. So when we asked people to briefly explain the consequences of extreme temperatures, we heard things such as, my child suffered heat stroke multiple times this summer. Or, um, my husband has M MS, so the heat is very hard on him. So this kind of qualitative data allows us to take a number like 56% of people have experienced extreme heat and really start to understand what does that mean for people who live in the cities that we are interested in and that we care about. The other thing we also asked is how did you respond to these events? And this allows us to um, look into what kind of costs are people bearing themselves, whether that be a disruption to their lives or a financial cost as well, so, so we can dig into some of those things. Oh dear, I've lost. Yes, please. Oh. That, lovely. Nope, that's perfect. I like the, the next one. Next yep. one? Yep. Awesome. Um, okay, so just to have one more look at one of the exposure variables that we were looking at, um, we had a, quick, a, a pretty close look at household flooding. The reason being, household flooding is probably the most costly uh, climactic events that individual residents bear. Um, the uh, research coming out of the University of Waterloo has said that um, the average basement flood costs about $40,000 for Canadians. So we looked into how, is, um, how are people in the region experiencing flooding. So we found that 15% of experience exp uh, of people that we talked to had experienced a household flood in the last two years. And that's not a massive number out of the total, but if that's 150 households, and we think that it, costs, it could cost upwards of $40,000, that's a massive cost that's being borne um, by people in the community. Um, we, we also found things like this, which is quite surprising to us, that only half of households are actually insured against flooding. Many people don't actually know if they're insured against flooding, and so this is one of those awareness building um, contributions that I think the partnership is making um, in helping people get prepared. And then these two stats here, that 37% uh, of respondents have sump pumps that we talked to across the seven municipalities, and 22% of them are using rain barrels. Those are exciting numbers for me because they identify leverage points that we can use through our partnerships and through our municipalities to help support um, people in the region. We know uh, Lincoln, Shannon, you talked about the rainbow program happening in Lincoln, and we know in St. Catharines there's a flood alleviation program which provides grants for people to put um, backwater valves. Th that's happening in many of the regions, uh, the, the municipalities as well. So this gives us places where we can actually intervene and start to build capacity um, against this. So again, um, we've got qualitative data on all of these things as well, and if we just have a quick look at how are people sensitive to these flooding events, um, we hear stuff like this. So the first flood required removal and disposal of all flooring, wall coverings, and appliances. The second flood was caught earlier um, and only did localized damage. And so that speaks to the sort of, not only that we know climate events are going to be more intense going forward, but they're also occurring more frequent, frequently. And it's an important reminder that you might be able to manage one event, but then the second events are coming um, usually more, more uh, closer after the previous um, event. And if we look at how people coped, I think this kind of data is really important for us too. Uh, people are telling us things such as the first flood, they were able to file an insurance claim, but the second flood um, they had to deal with on their own. So there's all these little nuances of how um, individuals in the region are bearing costs of um, these climactic events. So, uh, I would like to finish with the good news, um, some really exciting stuff that came out of this survey. Uh, we were blown away by the support that we found across the region for climate change adaptation planning. So 87% of the people that we talked to believe that humans have the capacity to tackle this challenge. And we know that um, the belief that you can actually do something and feeling empowered to make change is huge and a really big source of adaptive capacity in the region. Uh, over half of the people that we talked to said that climate change adaptation is a top priority for their household. 
And that might not seem so massive, but those are compared against things like paying your mortgage, getting your kids into school. And so you realize it's really big. It's on people's minds. And this one I think is, is very exciting. 85% of the people we talk to support municipal resources being used for climate change adaptation. So there's a lot of interest, there's a lot of momentum and we can build on this um, going forward in the partnership. So let me end with a quote uh, that comes from Kingston's Climate Change Adaptation Plan. It's time for us to stand and cheer for the doer, the achiever, the one who recognizes the challenges and does something about it. So I think it's such an exciting um, partnership for us because these seven municipalities are really stepping up Climate change is here, it is presenting us with some massive challenges, but these municipalities are um, taking action and going forward on it. So to me, this is really what climate action um, looks like and is all about. Thank you.